I sometimes think of the analogy of the kitchen, where the kitchen is this explosive area of things flying all over the place, uh, some things working out, etc. And then finally, it's brought out on a very clean plate uh, presented by a waiter that's very smartly dressed. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Devers. I'm Jamie Derringer, and this is Clever. And today we're talking to product designer Carl Gustav Magnuson. Carl has had a long and illustrious career spanning many facets of design, graphics, automotive, product, furniture, education. And he's also worked with many legendary designers and brands, such as the Eameses, Knoll, BMW, Ross Lovegrove, Maya Lin, Frank Gehry, Ettore Satsas, the list goes on and on. Although he was born in Sweden, he spent much of his childhood in Canada on a farm tinkering with the machines. He studied engineering and architecture and then went to work with Charles and Ray Eames straight out of school. He spent the better part of 30 years working with renowned furniture brand Knoll and now runs his own product design studio. Maybe you've heard this definition of design. Design is function with cultural context. That comes from the mind of Carl. Well-rounded? Absolutely. He's got stories and ideas for miles. Let's talk to Carl. I'm Carl Magnuson. I live primarily in New York City, but also in Milan. I'm a industrial designer, and my vocation and method of hopefully contributing to society's needs in a thoughtful way. Wonderful. Why do you do it? The accumulation of experiences in childhood, guidance uh, from my parents, and maybe uh, innate interests in how things work uh, naturally uh, led me to that direction. And I think it really all began when I was um, working on the farm. Yeah, let's talk about your youth. So you were born in Sweden and then you grew up in Canada. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your childhood and how it shaped you. I was born in Malmo at the southern tip of Sweden. That's across from Copenhagen. And you can now take a, uh, a after, I think, 200 years of arguing, they finally built a bridge between each other. <laughs> and Malmo was a historic port of the, uh, one of the historic ports of the Hanseatic Empire. That was the time when uh, everything happened on water. Uh, and it was really only uh, with the invention of steam railways uh, that things started happening inland. But during the Second World War, we were stationed in Piteå. It's a wooded Lapland town near the Arctic Circle between Finland and Norway. Upon war's end, we moved to the plains of Canada uh, to take over our grandparents' farm near Calgary, Alberta. The only thing common was the temperature, clear skies, occasional aurora borealis, not many people. So it was indeed a horizon-broadening experience. Hmm. No trees. Wow. What age were you when you moved? Uh, seven. So do you remember a lot about your time in Sweden? I remember that there was this little metal boat in the refrigerator that if you put the proper chemicals in, it could uh, drive across uh, the bathtub or something like that. Uh, going out with my parents uh, to find mushrooms, this happens uh, to be a typical pastime of people uh, in the Lapland area. Uh, and then I, when it was told to me that we were moving to another country and they were going to buy a new car in uh, Windsor, just north of uh, Detroit, uh, they showed me a bunch of brochures and there was a fabulous Lincoln Continental, which uh, was done in beautiful watercolor, uh, mm. showing uh, quite happy people next to their yacht. And I um, <laughs> uh, suggested that we should, you know, maybe get that. And uh, they said, <laughs> explained to me, look, we're farmers. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, uh, we, we, got the, we got the default uh, dark blue Mercury four-door sedan and um, uh, drove across the United States and then up, uh, up into Canada. So the, those were my memories of 
Sweden until we got to North America. And so when you were in Canada, what was your home life like? You mentioned running around on the farm. It was really quite interesting. It was a large farm. We had a fairly large machine shop. Keep in mind that in Canada, everybody is an immigrant. We had uh, two to three Germans working in the machine shop. I gravitated there, uh, perhaps because it was warmer, but really because you could take things apart and hopefully put them together. And they were very patient with me. And my father approved of it because he was an engineer. I really got into it right, right away. My sisters and I, we went to the school uh, in the town. It was probably a couple of miles we would either bike in or walk in. There was no such thing as uh, paved roads, uh, which was just fine. You learned, you learned really how to bike. I do recall that um, nearly all the teachers were from uh, England because Canada paid probably three times more. Uh, my father, who was an engineer from Uppsala University, uh, in, encouraged me to start drawing. And um, he lent me his drafting instruments at the age of 12. Mm. And I started drawing cars in ink. You draw, you make a mistake, with a, and then with a razor blade, you uh, erase it and start over. My mother was very kind and subscribed to Fortune magazine and Architectural Forum magazine, which even by t- today's standard or any standard was a extraordinary architectural magazine. And uh, I was able to add to that popular mechanics and rod and customs from California to the list. I mean, I think my fate was sealed, especially with rod and custom. Um, (laughs) uh, This was an area that uh, I didn't realize until later on that uh, may have been the essence of design in that hot rod and custom car uh, people they don't want to make the same thing the other person did. Right. It would just be a production car. So they were, by definition, individualized. I obviously uh, was uh, infected by this view of things and um, would study very carefully what one person did to their 39 uh, Mercury Coupe. Uh, That would be in in the customs area. Uh, because they didn't go very fast. And then, of course, what people were doing with uh, 32 Fords, etc., which were to go fast. But out of that, you you realized the, the this sort of, not naive exactly, but these people didn't go to Art Center that were doing this. They intuitively figured out what new forms could be in the hot rodding area, uh, finishes and performance and the expression of that. Um, it's a, uh, actually a very disciplined, aesthetic area of uh, design and very easy to uh, under or overstep where it should be. So uh, I love that stuff. And in fact, when I was 15, I was uh, allowed to buy a car. Insurance wasn't the problem because you just drove around the farm uh, and I was uh, admonished not to hit cattle. Um, that was about the extent of it. Um, and, and so, uh, Just you don't know, run started, over the cows, Carl. Yeah, <laughs> Otherwise, I mean, have at it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there were no other cars around to, 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 that, that you would likely to hit, but you just had to be careful with those things. So I learned how to chop and channel. Terrible work, but at least I was able to um, somehow, I think probably we, my mother kept a photograph of me and the car at 15. It was a... Heck of a lot of uh, fun, but, you know, eventually it was uh, time to uh, move on to higher education. I love the the picture you've just painted for us because it started with a, a young boy moving to a new country and being totally transfixed by a Lincoln Continental and then living on a farm with a with a machine shop and full license to tinker and hot rod and a family with engineering background and architectural forum magazines. So it sounds like your interests were all being kind of supported and and nourished. You it doesn't sound like you had any trouble giving yourself license to to tinker around and really express yourself. It was uh very much encouraged partly because it was a respected uh discipline. Mm-hmm. Uh 
uh, kept me out of trouble. I mean, quite frankly, in the plains of Alberta, there's not much trouble to get into, but never mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, being, uh, being on the farm allowed me a chance to uh, understand how things work. Uh, just the whole notion of, yeah, that's right. Uh, you plant the seeds and then uh, with perseverance, uh, you wait until um, it's time uh, to harvest, etc. A slightly low, slow process for someone who eventually wanted to become an indus- uh, industrial designer. But I really wanted to become a car designer, even at the age of 12. My father explained to me that designing cars is about as deep as designing a tie. I wish he was still around so I could tell him, you're right, Ralph Lauren started as a tie designer and has the greatest car collection in the world. (laughs) Um, But I, I sort of thought engineering, not really knowing what it was, but respecting uh, what my parents were doing, um, I I felt that that might be my calling. My sister already had a math scholarship at the University of Idaho. She was the one that got the grades, you know. Mm. Seemed to, it seemed to be a good option because it was only a couple of days drive straight south. Oh. Uh, my roommate, Gordon Walker, now really a great architect in Seattle, uh, suggested that architecture might be more fun because you can get to work all night. So I switched. Okay, um, so you went to University of Idaho first to study engineering, and then you had this roommate, Gordon Walker, who said, hey, what about architecture? And you were like, that seems hot. I'll do that. Yeah. Is that, that kind uh, of the story? Okay. I mean, quite frankly, engineering was sort of a nine-to-five uh, study job, whereas architecture was never ending, and it just seemed to be more interesting. That went actually very well, but then my parents suggested I consider transferring to the Schalmers Institute of Technology in Gothenburg uh, to continue the architectural studies. So I did, and when I was there, I had no idea how much fun um, uh, education could be. We would go on field trips to the Royal Academy of Art in Copenhagen, and uh, I listened to this guy uh, called Paul Kerholm give a lecture. Fairly soon uh, later, I started realizing how brilliant he was, and I continue to feel that uh, today, to this day. There's something about the environment of Danish design that creates amazing, especially early modernist talents, besides Paul Kerholm, uh, Borg Mogensen, uh, Mogen Koch, and, of course, Arnie Jacobson, who mm-hmm. is probably the epitome of all, who could design anything from a salt shaker to a building. So that, that was all really uh, very interesting. But architecture itself is site-specific, and therefore it doesn't lend itself to duplication much. And um, I was more interested in the social impact of well-designed and mass-produced objects and so my my passion, I think, uh, moved at that time towards uh, industrial design, uh, which was not taught there. I mean, mm. had I known it, I would have studied uh, at Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, where my uh, one of my sons later on uh, did. And I continue to think that it's the most extraordinary uh, place for an industrial designer. So um, when I finished my studies, I wrote a letter to... Charles and Ray Eames, uh, with a small sketch of a museum exhibit uh, I had uh, done. I had just been working uh, on a Braun exhibit for their first store in Sweden Mm. and a um, sports car showroom for the agent of Alfa Romeo, Lotus, and Morgan. Uh, In a few weeks, I received a positive response. First of all, that sounds like a gutsy move. Second of all, those those projects you just mentioned, were you you're just out of school? Are you an intern or how did you get gigs like that? Um, I didn't have a lot of money. I mean, I was a student. I started to supplement my income. I started making candles in beer cans and here we go. Here's the hot rodder. <laughs> <laughs> you're right and and um and clothes, uh, clothesline pins uh, holding the wicks up. And 
much to my surprise, I just wanted to make a little bit of money, but it turned out I made quite a bit of money and moved out of the student apartment to a very small villa on um, uh, the ocean side. And it turned out my neighbor was the guy who was the head of Braun Electric for Sweden. And uh, I told him about my passion for all of Dieter Rams's works, etc. And he says, well, why don't you... Um, uh, why don't you design this exhibit then uh, in our the new store we're putting together? Wow. So I did that together with uh, doing the sports car showroom. I I think um, helped me move in in the direction I, I wanted to go in. I mean, I got the the showroom job because I'm I'm so enthusiastic about design. Uh, Uh, that uh, I think I I sort of exuded it when I was in looking at all the cars I couldn't afford. Oh, I have no (laughs) doubt. And passion is totally infectious. And I think that your passion preceded you and got you some good gigs. (laughs) Yeah, well, um, perhaps it did. When I finished up the project, uh, I asked him if I could, uh, I said, I'm going to move to the United States. And I said, can I buy a Morgan from you at a discount? And uh, I did and picked it up in New York City and with really, I mean, you know, this was back in the late 60s, with really only about 100 or so dollars, headed off to uh, Venice. Gas was 30 cents a gallon. We camped to save money. No problem. Sometimes we arrived uh, at at the campsite so late we didn't quite know how close they were to the railway tracks, etc. But anyway, uh, it was a great time, uh, and my young uh, kids loved it, and um, uh, all all well. I mean, you you were mentioning that it was uh, a bit of a, a bold move to moved from Sweden to Venice, but um, California, but really, I was already used to the idea of traveling, having moved from, you know, southern Sweden to northern Sweden is about the distance of the height of California, and then moving over to Canada was, you know, five, 6,000 miles, so uh, none of that actually was a deterrent, and later on in life, it actually became beneficial that uh, I didn't see distance as an in- inhibitor. So I uh, ended up at the Eames office in Venice. It was in 901 Washington Boulevard um, with all a completely anonymous building with an old faded sign that said Bay City's Garage. Mm. Um, And uh, there were two black Cadillac convertibles outside um, (laughs) with white tops. One was Ray's and uh, one was Charles. Uh, and and then I think it was a there was a pink thunderbird that was the accountant, um, <laughs> and it was perfectly fitting. Uh, I love that you're already identifying people and their personalities by their cars. Well, first of all, I always did. Yeah, uh, and, and you learn in. I mean, it is its uh, own uh, visual language. Yes, and in Los Angeles, as as the cliches go, you you are what you drive, <laughs> um, and, and as they also say, look, you can sleep in a car, but you can't drive a house. <laughs> mm. uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that's from uh, some Latin proverb or something like that, <laughs> right? Right. Uh, but but really, my tenure with uh, the Eames office was that that was my real design education. I had no idea what design could do until I came there. I mean, ranging from city planning, architecture, exhibitions, graphics, photography, and of course, furniture uh, design. Uh, When I arrived there, they were finishing uh, up powers of 10. Um, A friend of mine, uh, Paul Bruweiler, was the guy who was graphic designer and photography was laying down on the grass being photographed. Uh, I mean, it was just a, a wonderful factory um, of ideas, and um, I worked on exhibits for the proposed National Aquarium, um, never came about, designed by Kevin Roach and Dinklo. IBM uh, was one of their main uh, clients, and the project um, I worked on was the analytical machine exhibit by Charles Babbage. He was a polymath from Britain, and his paramour, Lady Lovelace, the first computer program in the mid-1800s. 
Wow. The Herman Miller History Wall was a lot of fun. Uh, I was actually working under Deborah Sussman, the wonderful graphic designer who on her own created uh, some of the World's Fair uh, exhibits. And then the first foray actually into the into furniture was with Ray Eames. Um, they had designed the new Eames chaise intended to be in offices, very narrow, about uh, 18, 20 inches wide or so. And uh, she was working on the finishes and colors. And um, I was asked to help her out going, getting things like um, finishes to match up. And she wanted the frame to be an eggplant uh, finish. So I ran out trying to find, I'd never seen an eggplant before, oh. um, and ran out and trying to find one. We found it. Uh, she was traveling. Uh, the thing had faded by the time she got back. Well, I had to go out and get a fresh one uh, <laughs> so that the color uh, was correct. But uh, to this day, I was I'm thinking, what a brilliant insight into a color to use on a product like that. Because usually people gravitate to black, silver, white, you know, beige or something mm-hmm. like this. But here's this eggplant and uh, still wonderful with a lot of interesting people come by. Alexander Gerard would visit with cartons of his toy collection um, for the creation of films that he was doing uh, together with primarily Charles. Uh, and Saul Bass would make an occasional appearance. I'm not sure they did any work together, but nevertheless, uh, they were comrades. My colleagues were from all, all over the globe, uh, Australia, Japan, and it was a it was a big experimental factory. And the vestiges of all the prior projects would hang from the ceiling. It was uh, really quite uh, wonderful. I mean, you really never wanted to go home. And um, actually, you weren't encouraged to because there was so much work. <laughs> um, uh, the work was the decoration. It was just constantly changing. Um, there was n- never a sense that anything was finished. It was a continuous laboratory of ideas that were being put together primarily for um, primarily for IBM's uh, exhibitions. And it really in, instilled in me an endless inspiration and confidence of what, what design can do and hopefully how I could uh, perhaps um, contribute. I, I left Ames' office to open my own office in Rudolf Schindler's house. And um, uh, I knew that I'd learned a lot about slideshows and photography, et cetera, at the Ames office. And I quickly got a project with Warner Brothers to do a 600-image slideshow for their new record introductions, uh, such as Roxy, et cetera. I mean, they were, it was all terrific stuff. And they were wonderful to work with because they had the money, they wanted it done fast, and they paid fast. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and I said, well, I, would you mind advancing me so I could buy some uh, motor drive Nikon? Sure. No problem. Uh, they just hand you a check and we run away. So it was great. Uh, great fun. Uh, being in Rudolf Schindler's house was wonderful. Uh, I was on King's road in West Hollywood. Um, I got to know, um, uh, his, um, widow Pauline, who was writing books on, uh, the future of, um, I think socialism or something like that. And um, she kept on trying to sell me her Corvair. (laughs) Uh, It was before Ralph Nader actually had destroyed the car. Right. Uh, But um, uh, still, uh, I'd asked if I could rent the garage because I was expanding. She says, if you buy the Corvair. (laughs) um, And it didn't happen. Uh, But then Noel knocked literally on the door. What? Okay, so I was going to ask you about that. Did you go after Noel, or it sounds like they came to you? We need to hear this story. Uh, They came to me. My affinity with the furniture industry uh, was naturally with Herman Miller. I I didn't really know much about Noel other than the names of the uh, classic contributors. And, of course, Herman Miller had a beautiful showroom on Melrose Boulevard designed by the Eames office. Uh, and um, I had uh, visited the, the Knoll showroom, and um, uh, they asked if I would move, take over 
the management of showrooms and graphics. Uh, I didn't quite let on to the fact that I'd never managed really anything. Um, uh, and, and that applies, I think, to this very day. Uh, but nevertheless, um, that all worked out very well. They said to me, uh, they said, but you know, you realize you're going to have to leave Southern California to New York. Well, not having been in New York and having been brought up primarily in Northern Canada and Northern Sweden, how bad could the weather be? So uh, I said, yeah, it's fine. Let's do it. And so pretty soon we were in um, uh, in New York and um, that was extraordinary work. Uh, it was a it was the first and only real career in a corporation. It was an amazing confluence of ideals, thanks to Shu Knowles and colleagues and, and, uh, that set the standard of the aesthetics. It, you know, it was inspiring, inspiring colleagues at all levels. No one was there for the money. It wow. was the culture that drove us and uh, continues uh, to this day. Uh, wow. And the fact that people didn't uh, work just for the money meant that you got terrific people uh, from uh, all walks of life uh, that simply um, wanted to serve the canons of design that uh, Schoenel had um, uh, set down. Um, the work spirit, it uh, exuded confidence and we succeeded against many odds. We were a very small company. Um, at that time we were 25 million, now it's like a billion. Uh, but the positive camaraderie, I must say, it inspired our clients and the clients um, were desiring to use uh, our products. So it all worked out. Um, and for you began, personally, you said you started uh, managing their graphics and showrooms. Yeah. You And that was right around 1976, if I can place this oh, yeah. in time. You were there for almost 30 years. So can you yeah, talk about your... Years. Yeah, can you talk about your personal evolution within the... The company? Um, sure. I was asked to design and manage showrooms. Okay. Uh, uh, I figured out that that was not terribly difficult. It was a lot of fun. It was a ton of work, but that could be done. And um, I started um, commissioning people to design the showroom when we could afford it. Designers like Chinu Boeri. But with no management experience or real graphic education, uh, I was still put to be responsible for graphic design, which was under the creative forces of Massimo and Leila Vignelli. Mm. And thanks to them, I was exposed to the most rigorous thinking uh, which, uh, in graphics, which de- really guides me to day. I mean, when I take the subway here in New York, uh, I'm constantly reminded um, that the whole uh, subway map, which was... Uh, I think done 30, 40 years ago is still near perfect. There's sort of nothing you can um, do to make it better just because of their uh, critical um, uh, thinking. They're, they were wonderful. I learned so, uh, so much. Painfully, I learned to think in that manner. You say painfully. Is that, is that because it was just so much growth, like the learning curve was steep? I needed to listen very, very carefully uh, okay. to understand what they wanted to get done and how to get it done and um, how things worked in a uh, in a corporation. So it was an, uh, very grateful for that um, uh, opportunity. But then they um, they asked me to move to Europe to head up product design. This is an exciting leap. Well, it was wonderful. Basically, it was Marshall Kogan, uh, the co-owner of the company at that uh, time. Uh, and uh, he wanted uh, decisions rather quickly. Um, and I, I think he, he gave me like an hour to think about it or something like that. And I just, I found that if you do say yes, it's, and even if you don't quite know where you're going, you're going to learn a lot along the way. <laughs> so uh, I I just said yes. And so he said, fine. He says, um, you're going to Paris and uh, work out of the f- showroom and factory there and um, uh, until we get all the products streamlined and new products um, into the hopper. I said, yeah, fine, good. 
Uh, and then with that on the way, they asked me to move to London where we were opening up a new, in a sense, a new company uh, and designed the showroom that was uh, on Savile Row for uh, many years. Mm. Uh, I mean, very much, of course, enjoyed living in London. It was extraordinary. And Is that then, when you uh, started your tie collection? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was the wide tie collection, uh, <laughs> which I'm now slicing and selling off as uh, two, uh, uh, two thin ones. <laughs> then then the, uh, the company decided to buy a bunch of small firms in um, northern Italy, basically in Milan. So they asked me to move down there. So we did. You know, we got in the old old car and drove it down, worked with a variety, uh, that's when I actually started uh, getting a sense of what is what is Italian design. Mm-hmm. Working with extraordinary people like Gaio Lente and um, uh, Richard Sapper, who um, is actually German but was working there. That was uh, such a phenomenal time, and of course, that's also where um, I met uh, my wife, architect Emanuela Frattini. Um, was a very joyous time. It really uh, got me further in, uh, into the processes, uh, the manufacturing, uh, respect of of how development happens. Many people think that the designer just designs it and then, uh, okay, so we're ready to put that into production. Not at all. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it is even the best designers you need uh, a product development staff that often consists of engineers and uh, people that know how to transpose the idea into manufacturing to the point where it is efficiently made, will last 20 years, inexpensive, available in uh, any number of finishes, fabrics, etc., and uh, make a profit for the company company and pay for the tooling, etc. I mean, these are the things that really designers don't spend a lot of time thinking about, but those are the factors that indeed make a product uh, successful and have a, has a mark uh, on society. I mean, maybe I'm a little bit nerdy this way, but I think that's the exciting stage for me because Conceptually, designs can be anything, right? But when you start transposing them into manufacturability, that's when they become rooted in reality. And that's when you get to fine tune them and refine them to make them actually work with real people in real circumstances. And then, as you well know, the ones that do that really, really well, well, they last a long time and they become icons. And that forging in the fire is the the real alchemy of design, I think. Very well put. Uh, I sometimes think of the analogy of the kitchen, where the kitchen is, you know, this ex- uh, in a restaurant, in this explosive area of um, things flying all over the place, uh, some things working out, etc. And then finally, it's brought out on a very clean plate, uh, presented by a waiter that's um, very smartly dressed and uh, <laughs> it's pre- presented before you. And all you need to do is add the right wine choice. But it's in the <laughs> kitchen that is so much fun. You're right. Um, uh, you know, because uh, that's where things go wrong and right, uh, et cetera. And um, I think you're right. The, the development aspect of it is, is very much the unsung hero aspect of design. Mm-hmm. And I think having worked in designing for various companies, the quality of the product development people is uh, sometimes the make or break uh, of it. I was then asked to come back to New York. This was probably um, 15 years into it all, or maybe more, uh, to uh, head up uh, design worldwide uh, out of New York. Uh, Not that any design happens in New York, it happens el- elsewhere. But uh, nevertheless, the, the, um, the, chair, the president wanted everybody close in his own zip code. So mm. uh, that brought me back to there. But uh, it also brought me very interesting opportunities to 
to commission people like Ross Lovegrove, who's fantastic, um, uh, continues to be fantastically talented, and work with masters like Frank Gehry. Andrew Kogan, now um, CEO, was the one that actually first tapped Frank and worked with him on on uh, the uh, the Bentwood series, and then I acted as uh, I think a surrogate designer to help produce some of the other models uh, that came out. In all of these cases, uh, uh, especially if it's uh, if it's uh, it's a great architect that's not not used to designing furniture, such as uh, also such as Richard Meyer, um, you really need to work with the product developers um, to and and the craftspersons to make sure that the product comes out as it should. Mm -hmm. And it all worked well. You were the guy that was facilitating all of this, right? You were you were that's, spotting that talent, the bringing them in and helping them guiding them through the product development process with that team and making sure that the output was null ready. Right. That, okay. that was the responsibility. Uh, and of course, many people helping out. One of the persons uh, that uh, worked very closely with me was architect Albert Pfeiffer. We felt that Noel had such a rich heritage. We've got to create the Noel Design Museum. Uh, we had so many pieces in our history that I thought it was appropriate that we do a museum just for our own products. It became also a mine for reintroducing excellent designs. Uh, we also, aside from the normal duties of uh, product development, uh, created the Noel Design Symposium at the Cranbrook Academy of Arts, where Shu Noel was brought up uh, with the Sarnin family. It came actually very quickly. Um, we invited about 80 customers a year and about 15 speakers over a period of eight years. I just said, talk about anything that you're passionate about. Do not present your portfolio. Do not talk about no. Just talk about whatever you're passionate about for exactly 45 minutes and that made it a lot easier, and uh, it was it really was a lot of fun. Then, of course, the recession came, and we decided to just drop everything when it when it came to the symposium. I'd love for you to connect the dots between making the decision to leave Null and then founding your studio, uh, CGM Design. I decided, you know, maybe I should just try to figure out if I could do something else, perhaps sort of dis rediscover. Uh, what my talents might bring. And so I decided to um, start on my own. What I discovered is actually I didn't do anything new. I just continued to do what I had been doing. I had an idea. I was driving, I think it was actually in Sweden, and I, I noticed these big aluminum trusses over the highways, I mean, the span is amazing. It's like a hundred feet, and and I and I wondered why haven't why hasn't that been applied to furniture? It simply hadn't been thought of. So I ordered one of these trusses online and started to play with it, and uh, came up with the idea maybe this could be a terrific benching system because you would then have up to twenty feet uninterrupted leg space and very fast assembly cost. Uh -huh. So I put together a prototype, showed it to Technion, and they said very quickly, we like it. That was product number one was on the way. And then I did five subsequent uh, ones with them. At the same time, I was putting together this idea of um, an ambulance that would revolutionize high-density city problems. Um, out in the countryside, in the suburbs, etc., normal ambulances, no problem. They're 10 feet wide, that's fine, but they're 10 feet wide for no particular reason, because inside the ambulance, there's not a lot you're allowed to do um, uh, to the patient. Okay. Uh, and with sirens on, they creep through traffic at about double walking speed or something like that, mm -hmm. which, of course, when, when it comes to trauma, like automobile accidents or bicycle accidents, something like that, or um, heart attack, 
stroke, etc., you really need to get to the hospital fast. Uh, and 10 feet wide sirens don't do it. it. We've all heard them behind us. And we can't, can't, can't get our own car out of the way. And obviously people are dying because we can't get out of the way. Uh, by redesigning the functions to about four feet wide, uh, you could slip through traffic like nearly like motorcycles. Uh, you would separate the functions. I mean, you know, when you, a normal ambulance can, consists of an EMS sitting uh, in the passenger seat and then a driver. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so you have two people. In this case, you reconsider all the functions and you have one person driving the tractor and the other person in the trailer with uh, the patient. And then the, uh, the trailer can actually be airlifted. Uh, it would have hooks uh, that you could uh, drop helicopter cables down and uh, simply take it to the heliport at the closest uh, hospital. My view is that uh, you need to apply design to altruism. I want to talk to you about your definition of design because it's well-formed and well-documented, but I think it would be very powerful for our listeners to hear it directly from your mouth straight into their brains. So if you would share with us your design is definition, I'm not going to say it. I want you to say it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> we've all been brought up to say, um, when, when you're asked about design, you say, oh, form follows function. Um, well, when you think about it, it's just a circular argument. And it really doesn't help the designer-client relationship because the client is embarrassed because they can't figure out quite what is that. <laughs> and the designer gets embarrassed if they're asked to explain it because <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> – I thought about it a really quite a long time. And um, my definition of design is function with cultural content. The function is the objective aspect or left brain, which responds to logic, such as engineering and cost parameters. The cultural content is the subjective area, which includes human interaction, heptic qualities, history, aesthetics, and perceived value. Mm. By separating the two, you can discuss it with your client or customer or fellow workers, etc., to identify which part of design are you referring to so that we can improve it or change it uh, or whatever. And then it's the designer's job to synthesize the two into needed and desirable products, which serve society when new, are repairable in use, if possible, and when obsolete can be repurposed and then finally recycled. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise Carl yeah, it's Magnuson. New. Uh, it's just uh, what I um, have uh, gr grown to believe and has been really practiced by many uh, wonderful designers, you know, such as Niels Differiant and others. Yeah. Wow. That's a great philosophy. So with 50 years of professional experience, I'm sure you've seen lots of things evolve and change. You have a longer lens than most people through which to view the field and practice of design. So what patterns have emerged to you and are there consistencies throughout the ages or do you see problems that keep coming up throughout different generations? We just want to learn a little bit about your insights. I mean, the way I learn or hopefully grow in design is um, observing what goes on outside of design. Uh, I visit trade shows that have nothing directly to do with design, such as transportation materials, sports, fabrics, gifts, aviation, agriculture. I mean, basically, you name it. You go to a show and that you know nothing about, you will leave um, with some knowledge. The problem with you go to a, a wonderful design show is all it does is sort of tell you where you are with your product uh, in the scheme of things. But I don't think you really learn uh, something. I think that the best designers are the ones that go to the uh, CES. That's one that I want to go back to, uh, CES mm. in Las Vegas. Uh, where you're finding out what's happening 
uh, uh, at uh, in the so-called computer and electronics show. Mm-hmm. Um, that's pretty amazing stuff. Or it, 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 even even if you go to uh, lots of lots of school um, shows, uh, end of year graduate shows, they're terrific. Uh, you probably won't find out a lot about new materials, but you will find out um, what people, um, young designers, are thinking. Mm-hmm and how they're uh, heading in their directions, whether you agree with it or not, you do, um, you do learn from it. I'm curious, you, you seem like a, a person who's open to and hungry for information. You've had the extreme good fortune of having worked with some of the greats. And that's sort of, I'm sure some of it's luck, but a lot of it is, you know, you putting yourself there and being open to it. In your 50 years of professional experience, what personal quality would you attribute the majority of your success? You know, um, the more I think about it, the more I'm grateful that um, uh, I happen to be brought up on a farm, even though I never wanted to be a (laughs) farmer, that's for sure. But the high work ethic and perseverance, that was the norm. And so that it was instilled without effort and has augured well and, quite frankly, I think uh, brought uh, me and our family happiness. Um, My wife and kids feel the same way about uh, high work ethic. The aesthetic sensibilities, I think, are thanks uh, to my mother um, because she arranged that we bring all our Scandinavian modern furniture. It was just, it wasn't Scandinavian modern. It was just furniture right. mm-hmm. in Scandinavia right. um, to Alberta in 1947. I mean, a rare sight indeed in a prairie farmhouse. Um, we, uh, any interior uh, I went to, you know, go over and visit a, a school uh, mate at their home. And I always wondered, where did this stuff come from? Uh, well, it all came from the Sears catalog. Right. Um, uh, but the not a stick of modern uh, uh, furniture. So we were, we were unconventional and an individual uh, family, and we were always encouraged uh, to be so. Um, and I, I think that that actually um, helped me um, when I got further on into uh, design. I have a question for yeah. you. It's just a theory that I'm forming after hearing you talk. But living and working on a farm, you got really aware of all the effort that and support that goes into planting seeds, um, nurturing crops, harvesting them. And some of that's up to, you know, the universe to rain and, and all of that. But Scandinavia seems like kind of farmland for design in that they plant the seeds and nurture and support design in a way that I think the U S could benefit from. Do you see similarities between uh, (laughs) farming and support in terms of design economy and culture? You know, farmers, they never throw anything away. Um, You, you will never see waste on a farm because they know how much effort went into creating a piece of uh, food, for uh, for example. Uh, Scandinavian design uh, has always been very much uh, a question of uh, less is more without uh, necessarily bringing up uh, Mises' uh, slogans. Mm -hmm. There's a sparsity and there's a a certain goodness out of making the minimum use, making the most use out of a minimum use uh, pieces of material. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I think there, there is that. Uh, but uh, uh, I must say also that um, uh, it took me a long time before I gave credit to uh, my time on the farm uh, because I didn't necessarily enjoy it. I mean, the amount of work was so high by everybody and which all could disappear through bad bad weather yeah. or something like that. And so it's probably the reason why I never really went in, into that uh, direction. But uh, there's, a, there's an awful lot to learn about um, just trying to be as close to nature as possible. N- you know, nature doesn't 
really throw anything away. Uh, it works as, as Spartan as it can uh, for the survival of its own uh, species. And I think that, that that's an endless source of um, inspiration and guidance for us. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I wish I had studied history more and studied biology uh, more so I could be more appreciative uh, of those matters. So what do you think about your future? My own future is fine. <laughs> I'm the real future I believe in a larger scale, the real future is as bright and as dim as our international cooperation in dealing with global climate change. Hmm. It is, I consider it, I just find it shocking and unconscionable how short-sighted politicians are concerning science and hence our children's Earth's future. Mm Mm-hmm. It's we are in a real existential moment and um, the people that can truly make a difference. I mean, it is politicians because uh, we as uh, citizens, we want uh, to take care of things um, for the future. But it's uh, up to them to create cooperation so that we can continue with this earth. Yes, Thank you for saying that, and thank you for saying it so forcefully. So, since you're still designing, I'd love to know if you have some new products coming in the pipeline that you would like our listeners to know about. Um, Sure, I'd love to. I have quite a few um, new projects uh, ranging from wristwatches to seating uh, to tables. But as the convention is, in our industry, I can't elaborate mm-hmm. on it because of not disclosure forms yes. <laughs> until it's released to the market. Yes. However, I continue to be called on writing short pieces for journals such as Metropolis, a chapter in a book on Craig Elwood's uh, architecture, and um, a specialty Porsche Collector magazine. I'm enjoying more and more the writing part of it, and it is the absolutely, I'm the least talented person uh, to be called upon uh, to string words together into a sentence. Well, I disagree, but (laughs) I'm glad that you're enjoying it, and we would like to follow those writings and look for those articles and also your new projects when you can talk about them. So what's the best place to find you online? The website, cgmagnuson.com. Okay. Or a YouTube called Thoughtful Design. And then on Instagram, hashtag Carl Gus Mag. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. You have had a very storied life, and Mm -hmm. you've put a lot of good thinking and a lot of good products out into the world. So thank you for all your work. Thanks for listening. To see images of Carl's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app, or go to cleverpodcast.com, where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And we would love it if you would do us a favor and write a review or rate us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us a lot. We also love hearing from you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Tell us what you think of this episode and tell us who you want to hear from next. You can find us at Clever Podcast. Clever is created and hosted by us, Amy Devers and Jamie Derringer, also known as 2VDE Media, with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.